Okay. Well, uh, welcome to the 2023-24 uh, season of the Astro Cafe. Uh, my name is Randy Enkin, and I um, am still the president <laughs> of the Victoria Center. Uh, and tonight I am chair of this first Astro Cafe of the season. And um, we're not uh, having any formal presentations, but uh, there's a whole bunch of things going on. The things I know about, uh, we're going to do a bit of a uh, uh, what uh, people did over the summer. Um, so first of all, the big outreach events, but also uh, anybody wants to bring up some personal observing, this would be a good time. Then we have a huge swack of announcements, uh, which um, we'll, we'll go through. Um, and uh, then once Mike gets here, he's not in yet, but we're gonna wait for him. And then I really want to spend a bit of time uh, paying tribute to Blake Nakaro and uh, also just seeing what people's experiences are uh, observing doubles, double stars. And um, I think in his honor, this is a very good thing to talk about. And uh, I've been you know, watching podcasts and things that, that he was on and uh, he was, quite the missionary on looking at double stars and he makes a really good case that they should be more popular than they are. Okay, uh, I don't need to put people on the spot, but if newbies want to say, hi, I've never been here before and my name is, um, you're very welcome to. Would you be interested in? Sure, hi. <laughs> So, and, and you have to speak up because our microphone's over there. And so half the people here. Okay. Um, sure. My name is Kirsten. Um, first time here. Uh, just joined the Royal um, National Society. Uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Canada. Uh, last week. Hoo ha. Yeah. And so um, I'm a complete novice at field observations. Um, never done that before, um, except for one very, one, one time experience. And, um, yeah, I have got a, just a lifelong interest and passion in astronomy and so, cosmology and astrophysics. And I, uh, I've got a, a you know, just a, a passion for uh, certain things. I love black holes. <laughs> well, I hope. You feel at home here. Okay. That'd be great. Um, okay. Did you see Marge's question? Is it possible to get a little closer just for a moment here? They'd like to see your face. Or just move the camera. Are you where are you? On just enlarge the uh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, let me let's hold on. I'll make you a temporarily. It's a mug show. Yeah, gonna walk, it's gonna walk yeah. towards the camera. Yeah, just peek around the corner. There we go. There's there you. Is. <laughs> okay, and I see somebody named Brian Chapel up there. Hi, uh, I'm uh, I'm Brian. I live in North Saanich. I I've been an RASC member on and off for fifty years, and uh, wow. I just decided to join again this year. Don't particularly know why. Oh, I know why. I know why because I bought a new telescope. And uh, that always gets things going a bit. Cool. Anybody else um, here say their name? Well, welcome back, Brian. Yeah, if you can see, once yeah. you start talking. Oh, yeah, right here, guys. This guy. Yeah, he'll be, he'll vanish in a second. Yes. Uh, you start talking. Well, I think we worked in an environment together. Yeah. Hold on a second. Oh, so, try and get this. Where am I? Oh, yeah. Okay, so what's your name and what's your interest? Okay, uh, my name is uh, Jim Mingenti. 
And uh, <laughs> hi, Jim. It's, it's David. Totally <laughs> uh, I have a telescope. Didn't know how to use it. Asked uh, Randy. Showed me. We looked at the moon. He said, "There's a meeting, and here I am." Here you go. It was even better. He came. He walked by the street and saw Eva and said, "I think there's a guy who takes his telescope out here." And Eva said, "Yeah, that's my husband." <laughs> Yeah, I know David uh, from uh, environment. Yeah. Well, that's great. I'm from and... environment as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Now, <laughs> and did, uh, did I hear a name? Steve? It's the astronomy I... club, if you're interested. Okay. No, maybe not. Yes, yeah. it was on a place upstairs. So yeah. Let me make sure that I hear the moment. Anyway, we're, we're right now yeah, just right asking if yeah. new people want to say their name and who they are. So, would you like to say hello, Roberta? I'm Rueda. I'm a newbie. I don't have a telescope, but I plan on getting one. Would you like to say hi to the crowd? Uh, certainly, Christian. And uh, I don't know much about astronomy, but my 16-year-old is really into it. He's just very shy to come tonight, so I thought I'd be the scout. See, see if you can. <laughs> okay. And could you just come over here for a second? Just uh, stand oh, about here, yeah. just so the rest of the crowd can see so you. Online. <laughs> most, most, most no, no pressure. Oh, there's people yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. There's no hey here. guys, all right, where are you? Yeah, yeah, just here. about here. Just come oh. here, be saying. Yeah, you're that's here. who just spoke. Hi. This gentleman. Okay, that's great. <laughs> okay, well that's super. I think this is the most new people we've ever had, and uh, so again, I hope you. Me. Oh, and yeah. Aaron. Yes, yeah. sorry. Oh. Hi everyone. Yeah, yeah. My name's Darren. Um, I've always had a passion for space. I uh, saw the observatory. I've been seeing it up on the hill for probably a decade, and uh, I've always thought it was closed. You know, for some reason, there's been like this rumor going around that it's closed. Well, during COVID. Yeah, or or even before that. Yeah. And so I decided to look it up online, and I went up and saw that it, it wasn't closed. It was open and fully functioning. And uh, brought my kids up there, and I was actually having more fun than my kids were. So <laughs> <laughs> I decided that uh, I would, you know, I found out about this group, and I thought I'd join and learn more about, you know, everything there is to know in the community. So good. Okay. Well, here. for old people and new people, just know that it's a very uh, free form sort of club we've got professional astronomers we've got very high level amateurs and we have a whole bunch of newbies and we have people with different interests we have people who are interested in photography people i'm lunar i really love looking at the moon uh there's so many different interests there are gearheads there's naked eye people and i uh, there's a real home, and the, and there's armchair astronomers, people who who really like looking at what are the you know black holes and cosmology and everything as well. And uh, we meet every Monday night, and uh, it's pretty free form. We usually will have a speaker, but today we're just going to have kind of I'm going to guide a discussion, and to that end. Let's uh, talk about what we've been doing this summer. And uh, I was thinking of going backwards in time. And so starting with the uh, Saanich Fair. And uh, Laurie, do you want to lead that? I'm um, sure. Hi, everybody. And welcome to all the new people. Um, uh, don't worry, we'll get you, we'll get you going really fast. <laughs> um, uh, yes, the Saanich Fair was, uh, was last weekend. I'd like weekend ago um and uh we were up there for we set up on friday night a uh, friday afternoon and then we were up there all day saturday all day sunday all day monday and i just i have some i have some volunteers the most important thing are the list of volunteers of people that helped uh, because it's really important um, to uh, acknowledge the number of people that actually um, came out and helped or did things in in different ways and i i could not we could not have done this without without everybody that came up um so we're really happy for that um for friday uh Sid Sidhu came up with his truck and Doug Chapman 
uh, Calvin Schmidt from the center and uh, and Calvin Schmidt and I, um, uh, we loaded everything from the CU and sent got everything over to the um, to the fair, and then spent quite a while getting everything set up and uh, and kind of tucked away. And then on Saturday morning we had um, Alex Schmidt, Ken Mallory, Deb Crawford, Richard de Montaigne. De Montaigne, uh, Rachel Holmes, Michael Wheatley, Alyssa uh, Archer, and Amy Archer. And all those people came on Saturday and we saw like at least 1500 people. Like we, you know, we probably had had connections with at least that many. I'm, I'm being probably um, a little bit too conservative. Uh, but um, but we chatted to people all day long. The, te the telescopes were out in the back. Um, uh, Ken and Alex did a fabulous job out there. Um, we um, uh, we were really lucky because it was beautiful and sunny and there was a really, really nice big um, sunspot on the sun. So it was made it really easy and some nice um, prominences on Saturday. And then on Sunday, um, we had uh, Dave Payne, Brock Johnson, David Lee, Ashish Bhatt, uh, Ben Dorman, Margie Welshframe, Jill Sinkwich, David Bale, uh, David um, um, uh, Robinson, Sid Sidhu actually came as well, and Morag Masterton, um, as well as another uh, young lady, um, Amy from our um, from the FDAO. And unfortunately, on Sunday it was cloudy, and by two o'clock it was pouring rain, and we had rain kind of coming off the edges and on the end things, and we tried to get everything um, kind of covered up. Um, and we weren't able to put out the telescopes at all on Sunday, even though we had all the big guns and all the really fabulous people ready to go. And we weren't able to put up the solar telescopes at all. So uh, it certainly was not as um, uh, not as uh, like lucrative in the number of people that we talked to or that we could show. But people still came by, even in the pouring rain. We were kind of huddled under the tents and people still came and we chatted to people just even even while we were doing that. And then on Monday, um, we had Alex Schmidt came all three days. Alex came on his bicycle from, from um, um, Oak Bay every day and was there by kind of like nine o'clock or 9.30 and he wasn't even winded. You know, like it had taken like an hour and a half to get to, to get to the fair. Um, although he was, uh, so I was really happy to have him there. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Ken Mallory came back for all day on Monday as well. Dorothy Paul and Oliver Robineau came. We had Evan Warburton uh, and Ben uh, Dorman up at the center. And then Marianne Gervais um, came up um, in the afternoon. We were pretty slight on Monday, we really needed to have two or three more people um, in on both either the morning or the afternoon, but we did what we could. We had the telescopes out. It was a lovely day. We were able to show the sun again, although that it had, it had moved and we kind of lost the really nice big sunspot. We were kind of left with little wee tiny ones, but there were a couple of nice prominences and we were able to show people that. Um, so I would say that we probably were within the 3,500 to 4,000 group by the time we finished on Monday that we that we did everything. I'd like to acknowledge, thank you to Margie Welshframe. Margie took over uh, doing all the all the um, emailing for the volunteers and um, and got all of that organized for me while I kind of worked in the background with some of the the other things that needed to be done. So thank you, thank you, Margie. And thank you to everybody who came. And I know that there's people here, even sitting there in front of me, that if they had been able to come, they would have come. And I know that you'll probably, you know, try maybe again next year. We can have we can have a few more people come out um, to um, help us out with you. So that's my little report. <laughs> Any wow. questions? Mm -hmm. you uh think that there's things that we should change that we could do better i guess more people more people more people we need yeah uh it it may would make it a little bit easier um we did raffle off a telescope and I'd like to add, um, uh, Erin Sutherland was the was the winner of the telescope, and she lives up in North Saanich. 
Um, we had a little bit of some problem with the telescope, uh, but uh, with um, uh, Sid, Sid and David Lee, and uh, particularly just lately Brock Johnson um, has kind of done a little bit of work on the telescope. And it's actually sitting out in my garage right now that I'm going to test drive it today, tonight, with after everything was kind of cleaned up and finished and, and uh, worked on, I'm going to test drive it tonight and I'm going to see if I can get it to her tomorrow. So she's she's got two kids, really looking forward to getting it. She was really, really thrilled to be able to have the telescope. So anyway, we can talk about that. I I think there, I mean, there's things we can absolutely always in you know improve on. Yes, for sure, so. Oh, that's great. Uh, is Dave here to talk about the uh, Island Star Party? Uh, Dave, oh, Dave. Or Reg. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to talk about the uh, Island Star Party, Reg? Uh, well, I uh, I went up to the Island Star Party and I put up my tent. And I was so exhausted from that that I sat out in a chair <laughs> and, and it was stunned the rest of the time, and I had sunstroke. <laughs> But I, I, in the whole process, I was amazed by the number of people who came out. And um, the this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the leadership of Dave Payne and a lot of help from his wife, Raquel, which we really appreciated, and a, a lot of other key members that really uh, made this happen. Randy was very active. He uh, he was uh, setting up sundials and, and sandboxes and stuff like that one day. And he had uh, a beautiful scale model of the solar system. And he gave a walk through that. Uh, Lori and Randy. Pardon me? Lori and I did the... Uh, oh, I... I, 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 promenade. Yes. I, I saw... I Well, it was a... a it was Randy that did all the work. Yeah. 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 It was uh, uh, excellent. And um, we had uh, kind of cloudy skies on the Friday night, uh, but with some clear interludes so people could see some of this thing and that. On Saturday, the skies were pristine, and it was a beautiful night. And some people set up as a, a kind of an arc of uh, uh, zero gravity chairs and lulled back. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, look for meteorites and they started showing up around 10 o'clock at night or 11 11 o'clock at night and it was roars of uh of cheers when one would show up and we had at least 10 on a, a really bright ones between uh 11 and midnight and the place sounded like a football game i mean there's these all these roars and cheers and things like that and it was a a wonderful atmosphere there uh -huh. Um, but, but even when there weren't the roars, there was this wonderful, excited sort of murmur going yeah. on until like one in the morning. It, the, the sound of it was just glorious, hearing all these people yeah. loving yeah. walking around looking at the telescopes. And yeah, it was a the sound of it was something that I'm going to remember. And, and I, I should also give thanks to our members from the Cowichan Valley yes. Starfinders. Uh, they uh, we built on uh, their shoulders, and they they came out and helped set up the tents and and strung the lights uh, down to the washroom and and things like that. Um, I don't know. I think estimates were that we might have the first night. I think we had about seventy or maybe sixty people at our talk. The first night the talk was by William Thompson. And William uh, is a UVic PhD student who had to defend his thesis the next week. <laughs> and I haven't been in contact with him too, but I, I suspect that he was successful on that. I hope so. But William uh, gave a talk on exoplanets and William uh, brought his wife and they pitched a tent and he brought up his telescope. And after his talk, uh, we had a good, uh, uh, he uh, looked for stars amongst the, the breaks in the cloud, and uh, it, it was wonderful, and uh, I, I really hope things went well for him. We had a larger crowd on Saturday night uh, uh, when Melissa gave a talk, and uh, Melissa's a, a new a member from, of the uh, Hertzberg Museum, uh, Hertzberg Institute uh, um, 
a what what do they call it uh H -A, -A. a a fellow a fellow of the uh, Hertzberg for the next three years and uh, she's working on caster but she gave a talk on supernovae and uh, uh unfortunately um uh we did not have a sound system there and we had about 70 people listening and it was quite a noisy environment and um it was hard to pick up and follow mm -hmm. some of her talk. Yeah. So that was a, a bit unfortunate. And I think next year, if we are going to have speakers, uh, I think we should explain to the park people that we're not a rock band. We're going to put up a huge PA system. We're just going to have a, a modest little amplifier there so people in the nearby area can hear them talk. And that would make it a lot easier for all. So uh, 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 that was good. Um, we had some people estimated maybe as many as 200 people on, on the second night. I'm not sure on that, but I know that the parking lot was filled. Cars were parked all the way down the streets and things like that. And there was, as Randy said, there was a real kind of positive vibe there. And there was a lot of scopes. There was a lot of nice gear there. Um, who was it who led the uh, kind of walk and, and explained the telescopes to everybody, Randy? Well, I did the second day, and the first day was from the Starfinders, and it was Atlas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, there was some pretty impressive gear out there, and a lot of it was owned by people who are living in the Victoria area who aren't members of our club. So uh, I hope we uh, applied enough guilt to them that they might join. But at any rate, uh, it was really a, a, a fun thing. And um, there's probably a lot of other things that I'm missing here, but uh, in the end, uh, I thought I it was a I've been to four star parties. Two, one was blown away by winds. Two were rained out, and this is the only one where I actually saw stars, and it made gave a different dimension to it. <laughs> uh, so I I really enjoyed it. So I I want to thank everybody who. Uh, help make this happen and if i've uh, missed your name I'm, i apologize but i will say that uh when we uh got there and set up the tents and everything um one thing that we had to do was uh register uh volunteers and i didn't really know what to do about that and margie welchframe stepped in there and she organized everything and had lists and all this sort of stuff and it was wonderful. So a big thanks to Margie for helping out on that uh, front. I really appreciate it. And a lot of people, uh, fairly senior, either bought new tents or brought their old tents and, and put them up in the field. And some people found there was a really strategic area to put their tents up, and that was near the trees, so they'd be in the shade and this stuff. But it went, it went really well. So, And then on a Sunday morning, uh, we we packed her all up, and uh, that was quite a bit of work. And uh, people were getting pretty dehydrated at that point. And the one issue about the park, it didn't really have potable water. So next time we're going to have to make sure that uh, people have plenty of water to drink and that sort of thing. So, uh, um, but we yeah. were out of the park by um, probably ten thirty, something like that. An important thing is that this is. The 26th Island Star Party uh, that's always been run by the Cowichan Valley Starfinders, but they have handed it over. We've had two years now of joint sponsorship, and uh, I am sure that uh, people will still be helping us from the Cowichan Starfinders, but it is now our baby to nurture and see it live for another 26 years at least. But it's a perfect site. It's very close to Victoria. We now have a July date. It will likely be the long weekend, the first weekend of August next year, because that's the new moon. Uh, I gather some of you prefer when there's no moon. And uh, <laughs> um, so we're, we're, you know, at some point we'll get started again working on next year. It was also financially really good. We, we um, it was just donation, uh, but uh, we certainly 
uh, folded more money than we uh, expended by probably a factor of 50%. Good. Um, remarkable, because we never actually uh, had tickets or anything. It's just people were generous. Awesome. Okay, uh, Lurie, I'm going to put you on the spot again. Let's talk huh? about the center of the universe star parties. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so all summer long, we have had star parties up at the center. Um, uh, on Saturday nights, we started um, at the end at the end of uh, oh, sorry, about middle of May is when we started. And our last one that we're going to have is the 16th of September, uh, which is this coming Saturday. And uh, they have been um, they have been well attended. Um, we have totally like sold out of the tickets, even though they're kind of free by donation um, um, every single week and have waiting lists and not, it uh, depends on the night, but not absolutely everybody came up, but we had a really quite a good attendance. Um, we're only allowed 200 people on the hill um, uh, for maximum kind of at any one time. So um, that that does, um, it does kind of curtail some things that we might be able to do, but it, it works out fine. We had um, presentations that were both in person and online this year. Um, and we only had one person who was online who forgot to come <laughs> and we had to very very quickly um uh, switch things around out in about 10 or 15 minutes and kind of get another presentation going and that was a little bit of a problem but everybody else was was really good we had some good talks and thank you to um to people here uh, that uh, that did some of them for us of so the in the resc that did some of those talks for us and um uh, so then we'll be so after the 16th, we'll be going into monthly star parties so we can give you the dates for um, uh, October, November, December. The annual general meeting will be on October the 21st, and we invite everybody to come um, and, and to come to that. James DeFrancisco, is the, who's the director of the HAA, will be giving a, a talk on what's happening at the HAA and what's happening up in Hawaii and what's going on, like in terms of of astronomy in Canada over the time. So if you're interested in that big picture of what's happening, then then this is the time to come. Uh, and then we're also doing sorry. In person over the week, over the week. He'll be he'll be he'll be in person. James D. Francesco so, will be in person. Do you still want to have people bringing up their telescopes at the monthly? Oh. Uh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, okay. it would be. Yeah, it would That's be great. great. I mean now. I mean, sometimes the weather, you know, is not as good in October, November, and December. But if it, you know, if it looks half decent, um, then absolutely, we'd like people up. Yes, and we could have, we could all, we can always use um, people to be on the deck or bring binoculars or you know, chat to people. Uh, I mean, a number of you have been have been up there. I'm kind of picking out some people sitting here, and uh, uh, and have come up and helped us uh, greatly, and it's been really good. The last time, the last one that we had, which was on the um, long weekend, um, on Saturday, or no, Friday afternoon, we only had five volunteers for the entire star party. Like a whole bunch of people were just not able to come, and we're not we're not available, and that's fine. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. But we panicked a little bit, and so we put out a call to the people at the on for the friends of the DAO membership, and for the people that were had bought tickets already for the like for the night, and we said can you help us? We need to have some extra people, you know, manning the doors or, you know, kind of, you know, trying to, trying to keep us kind of keep us going. And we ended up with 20 people who said, well, we don't want the star party to not be on. Like, so yeah, what can I do to help? And so we got 20 new volunteers on that, night, <laughs> on that night that said that they would come up and help. And we actually had kind of, you know, more people than we kind of knew what to do with. And that's a really, really good problem. Like that's awesome. So we were we were really happy for that. Um, we never had to do that before in all the time that we'd have the star parties, but that it just was that that one weekend that was just really hard. I mean, I mean, for us too, we were having trouble getting volunteers on that night, you know, on that on those days as well. So we know that that's that's, that's something to think about. 
Yeah, so we're, we're continuing on and we hope that um, that people will still continue to help us out for sure. Thank you. Already, I thought you said it ends on December the 23rd. Um, say that again, Alex. I thought you said it would be the 16th of Star Friday and September the 23rd. And the 20, the 23rd, I was wrong. It was not the 23rd. So we we are stopping on the 16th. Yeah. Yeah. And if anybody went up to the Vox Humana concert on the on the on the on the the weekend, on this past weekend, um, it was just wonderful. So yeah, we had we had lovely times for Vox Humana as well. So is Dan Posey online today? Because next Saturday, the 16th, um, is also our uh, quarterly um, night at the Plaskett Observatory. And uh, so contact him uh, if you would like to uh, get some time looking uh with the uh the big plaskett telescope he's going to be starting at 11 30 at night and he's developing the list of what they're going to be looking at and um if you haven't had the chance to work with you know a world-class professional telescope we're we're one of the super fortunate centers of the RAS that we get access to um, to such a, a machine. And uh, it then is a really, really good guide. And uh, it, it's just lovely spending a, a night with them. So- uh, Maybe I can just expand a bit. There's two, two ways you can participate. Yeah. So one way is just simply to, Dan, Dan will actually send out to membership a Zoom link. So you can just stay at home if you prefer to do that or you just have no way to get up there. Um, but you can also show up in person, uh, keeping in mind that MTAO is running a star party earlier, so you need to wait until Dan tells you to come up because otherwise it'll be in detention. But at that point, you can stay as long as you like. You can stay right till dawn if you wish to and uh, sit in the control room and participate in the uh, operation of the telescope. Dan will have hands-on control, but you can, you're going to be there if you want to be. And it's a lot of fun. And you do need to be on the active observers list for that, right? Good point. Okay. Um, I'll put contact to, Don, to Dan in the uh, notes. He's right. Uh, anybody want to talk about personal observing over the summer? We've been, we haven't seen each other for so long. Uh, is anybody like uh, is Brock online? Brock showed some beautiful pictures of uh, the planets on the Facebook. There you are. Yeah. Can you I'm share? Here. I can share some pictures. On this summer. I've taken too many pictures to show this session, but I could show some uh, just my past week with some planets. Okay, as long as you promise to show us more other weeks. Okay, I'll slowly. Uh, I don't want to take up twenty minutes here, but it's <laughs> been a busy summer. Uh, let me share. Let's see here. Actually, the first picture isn't a planet, but it's a planetary nebula. So can you guys see that OK? Perfect. That's the Helix Nebula, which is a challenging target because it barely gets above the southern horizon. But I've spent a few. Uh, I just finished this up in the past few days, and um, it's a, uh, a star that, of course, has expired by shedding its shell. But you can actually see in the center, there's a, a white dwarf, which looks very bluish, which is the central star that basically gave up and let off all of its gas. And um, it's it's a very spectacular um it's a nice target. It's a beautiful image. And then the next one was actually, Lori mentioned the um, rainy uh, event up at the uh, fair. I brought up the center's solar telescope. And uh, I the next day, I didn't go to the fair because I was only volunteering for the one day. 
but I had the solar telescope and well, I couldn't resist. So I connected a camera to it. And, um, and it's pretty amazing telescope. So I was able to get some really nice imaging. I think this might've been that sunspot that was more visible the day before, a couple of days earlier. But Is this two different exposures? Uh, yeah, that's kind of a composition of um, the surface and then the uh, prominences. So, but it's actually one exposure. Well, it's not, it's actually, it's a video, 30 second video that's been um, processed. And then I did a couple different, uh, I, I masked it and messed around to get the prominence to, to stand out. So hey, there's a question here about uh, what we're actually looking at. Can you? Uh... So this this is the sun. This is the entire sun. And around the perimeter of the sun, there are solar prominences, which are essentially kind of like storms on the surface of the sun, usually related to magnetic fields. And they're basically flaring out of the sun's surface. And we're actually looking at the sun in the um, hydrogen alpha wavelength. So this is, the sun actually has um, most of the light that we see is actually from what's called the um, photosphere. And the photosphere is the brightest part of the sun. And slightly further out from the photosphere is what's called the chromosphere. And the chromosphere is a, a slightly larger envelope that's actually comprised of hydrogen gas, which most of the sun is. But this hydrogen gas is excited in a way that produces a specific wavelength of 656 nanometers, I think. And there's a specific filter in these solar telescopes that allows you to look specifically at that wavelength. So you can see a lot of texture that you wouldn't be able to see through a, through a regular solar filter. And it, it, makes, it allows you to see amazing detail of sunspots and the little filaments between them. And you can see just the texture of the surface of the sun. And it's kind of a picture of temperature changes, I think. Yes, I do believe that's the case. As it sort of convex and flows, there are hotter and cooler spots. So. Actually, I could add a little bit to this. I, I just sure. started a sunspot uh, course at the AAVSO. And this is this is wonderful image, uh, Brock, because it's uh, all the stuff I've been studying this week. Um, the granulation that uh, uh, Brock was talking about is really the, the, the core stuff that happens on the sun. Um, these are convective cells, which are a result of the magnetic field in the sun. So basically, this stuff is, comes poking out. So the, major the majority of the sun is this granulation that you see here. Uh, the sunspots, um, now I haven't figured this out yet, but the sunspots run along the magnetic field as well. So I'm just learning how to count these spots now. Uh, the ones that are kind of um, horizontally uh, set, um, there are uh, something called leader and follower spots. And I never knew this before uh, last week. But now that I've seen these now, I, I can't not see them anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so a lot of these have a lot of um, stuff associated with them. So the sunspot, now you might wonder why you have a whole course on counting sunspots, but the sunspot count is what is recorded uh, in order to find out when the minima and peaks are for, for activity. So the other thing I learned also is the orientation of the sun uh, kind of rocks back and forth a little bit through the year as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But more details on that later. Uh, that's a great shot, Brock. Wonderful. Thanks. Question, Brock? Yes. It appears to me that there's something that looks like vignetting across the surface of the sun in, in your full-scale view. What is that? I don't know myself. I think that, it that, might that, actually that, literally be vignetting from the telescope. It, I it might, be partly, might be partly that, Brock, but there is natural limb darkening. So yes, but... uh, towards the edges of the sun, it's spherical. Mm -hmm. or it's more egg shaped actually but um it, it gets more distant so the outer edges are always darker mm -hmm. oh oh no i bet i know i bet when you're looking straight down you're seeing deeper and therefore hotter 
Whereas when you're over towards the limb, you're looking through the atmosphere. And so you're not getting as deep. And, and so you're seeing a cooler part. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. fact, I, 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 didn't, I didn't check for this in Brock's image, but there's another a feature called faculae, which really are only easily apparent on the limb because the limb right. is darker. I haven't I haven't seen any yet, uh, Brock, but uh, I'm sure there's some faculae around the the edge if you look Could carefully. Be. There's um, there is I think a little bit of vignetting that is actually telescope related because the brightening, like the limb darkening, would be consistent around the circumference. Whereas I think this is kind of there's a hot spot that's kind of in the upper right quadrant yeah, it's here, not symmetrical. and right. I think that just could be that my being the very first time I've pointed a camera through a solar scope, I probably should have been more obsessive about centering in the field of view because it, it is quite likely that that solar scope has a fair amount of vignetting. I didn't take flats or do anything like that to right. re, to eliminate vignetting. So it probably is a bit of vignetting. So hard to know for sure. But then I also uh, managed to get on, actually I should have showed them in different order, but this is Saturday morning. There was some really good looking seeing forecast. The, um, there was a nice still open patch of air over us. Uh, and um, I got out my scope to do some Jupiter imaging on the morning of the of Saturday and also did some imaging Friday night. So this is probably the best that That's I've good. been able to get out of Jupiter yet. Just the seeing was just so spectacular. And um, ended up the spot was just starting to wrap around and so i was pretty happy it's with gorgeous that. yeah thanks reg for the for the good weather you sent yeah, yeah you're I, you're in charge of the weather so you're quite welcome brock I, i'm glad you made good use of it but i'd like to say that uh, i thought there was amazing detail on, on that picture i really enjoyed it it's wonderful Thanks. What uh, Brock? What focal ratio is that? You must have got it pretty large in the scope. F F twenty two. Oh, is that all it is? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's a fair bit of detail for that. Yeah. Okay. Remember, the, there's brand new people that have no idea what you guys are talking about, right? So <laughs> oh, just yes, be really that careful. Is true. Of yeah. course, of course. Yeah. 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 It's an it's a a telescope with two meter two point three five meter focal length and a two times Barlow which basically increases the focal length to over 4,000 millimeters. So it ends up being very powerful magnification in order to see that. I also did a shot of Saturn. This is actually the wrong way around. Saturn was on the night because Saturn rises early enough that I could catch it before I went to bed. And the uh, Jupiter, I had to get up in the morning to see it. And Saturn, again, was hey, Brock, the seeing was quite good. Brock, yes. I the same magnification the two they are not i should have i should have adjusted them to be so just for comparison but saturn okay. is I, much more zoomed said in that the size of saturn with the ring is the same as jupiter and i just thought if you could flash between the two it's not that different yeah i i just didn't i yeah. i didn't purposely i could easily do that because the pixel the, the original pixel scale would be comparable but i played with the size. I generally, with the planets, they're not that detailed. So I generally zoom out and make a big black background so that they, if you zoom in too tight, unless you're taking the images from the Bahamas or somewhere like that, you're not going to get the, the kind of detail. So, And then I also uh, composited this Saturn with the other previous two years. So you can actually see that Saturn, the, this year was the top image here. And you can actually see that the way that we are looking at Saturn, Saturn is kind of like the Earth in that its axis isn't perfectly vertical in the orbital plane. It's also tilted a bit like us. So as we kind of rotate relative to each other, Saturn goes through periods where it's tilted toward us and we can really see the rings. And then it slowly gets um, tilted flatter and flatter. And next year and the year after, it's going to be quite flat. Um, both summers next year will be slightly tilted downward, and then the summer after that it will be slightly tilted upward, I believe. And then and then it'll start 
tilting upward and upward to the point where we'll be, we'll be kind of looking at the underside of what we're seeing here over the coming years as it tilts. Keep up and, the good work, Brock. Sorry? We're going to be following for years. Yeah, I got a lot of work to do. I'm going to, in Astro Cafe, in eight years, I'll have a nice big line of these. I'll have to stack them up. <laughs> I also have another one from the year in 2020, but I hadn't processed in into this composite yet. So that'll be coming. And that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you. That's fantastic. Anybody else will have any uh, observations to uh, share? I don't know whether Jill might like to talk about um the Explore the Universe program that we're working on. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really nice. Why don't you, Margie? Margie, you, why don't you talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Explore the Universe group is uh, doing a um, uh, uh, working our way through a booklet called Explore the Universe, which is which we have from um, Rask Canada, and uh, it comes with both a uh, in information book and this is the workbook, and in the workbook uh, are is um, our lists. So those lists are uh, items in the sky to be found, to be looked at, to be observed, and also to be drawn. So there are 110 um, possibilities, and you must draw 55 of them. And out of those 55, there are things like constellations, uh, you observe uh, craters on the moon, um, uh, specific things in the solar system, deep sky objects, uh, and double and multiple stars. Those are the items. So this is the kind of thing that one might draw. So there, for example, this was on, uh, this wasn't during the summer, this was before the summer, but there's an example of uh, Copernicus, Copernicus on the moon. Yay. And then it comes with, uh, when you record information, you record um, the date, the time, uh, the weather, the sky condition, uh, what you're looking at the uh, object with, and, um, and then uh, a little description of it. It takes a year to do this program because you start in one season and work your way around. We started in January, I think, January, February, January, February, and you have to work your way around through each season. So we have, um, I don't know, but there are about six of us or so that are either observing only or observing and drawing. And, um, it's a heck of a lot of fun. Jill has been leading us through this because she has completed the program and uh, Jill knows everything uh, in so many ways. Um, so um, she, uh, so uh, we are working our way through it and we'll be finished um, by hopefully the beginning of February next year. And it's a great way to learn about the sky. Just so you know, this is the Explore the Universe, but there also is an Explore the Moon book, which maybe some of us will be working on next. That's it. We, oh, we've been out several times. <laughs> we've been out a number of times, every couple of weeks uh, to Cattle Point. I went once and it was just so fun. I, I just wanted to say, I know, I know Joe won't, like this very much, but I, I I just want to give Jill a huge applause yes. for le leading this group. Uh, I I got to hang out with them a few times, so they they let me hang out with them occasionally. So I I come out and uh, 
Yeah, it, it is. It is so rewarding to hear them find these objects. And I was saying to Margie, finding them once is one thing, but to repeatedly find them uh, is amazing for these for these beginners. Uh, uh, you too can do this if you haven't <laughs> been able to do it yet. Yes, thank you, Joe. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. We have a good chat when we're out there, even if we're not looking at things all the time. <laughs> And it's a beautiful location. Cattle Point has so been so um, it's so dark and warm, and you hear the waves kind of lapping in, and it's been it's a, it's nice. It's fun. Yes, for people who don't know, for people who are new, Cattle Point is a dark sky area. It's a designated dark sky area. People like Canada there. How many times? <laughs> Clear night. That, that's your other uh, home. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I just love that people are getting together at Cattle Point. That, that's just super. Uh, here, I'm going to show a couple of pictures of the moon. Or one, but in two different ways. This was, um, oh, no, I want to do it this way. If we go share. So this was Saturday morning. Um, there's something I just love. I, I got up at four in the morning and uh, the moon was shining in my skylight. And so I went down with my telescope and uh, Oh dear, I don't know why. I mean, life has been rich and full, but I have not been getting out with my telescope nearly enough. And being out with nobody else around and and just having Luna there to, to keep me company, I, it, it was wonderful, wonderful experience. Anyway, the other lunar guy in our club is uh, Mike Nash. And um, he... Uh, Oh dear, how do I do this? There we go. Um, he was out with his gear. He is a wonderful lunar photographer. And um, so this was actually the day before. Uh, he did take a picture the same morning. It's actually a bit after I took mine. And I don't know whether he's processed it, but... Um, the picture that he put on Facebook was pretty raw. So um, I'm comparing this with, uh, I'm gonna guess it was about 18, 20 hours before mine, but um, I just love seeing the, the comparison between what I saw in the eyepiece and what uh, Mike was able to catch. One thing that's interesting and this is just an optical illusion to me, but I feel that the sinus iridium, the Bay of Rainbows, which is a lovely name, especially since it's on the Mare Imbrium, the sea of showers or of rains. Um, you have the, the, this is the Bay of Rainbows. And to me, this looks pretty round, whereas the way that I caught it, it was very elongated as it's towards the side. On the other hand, the craters, you can see them that they're very oblique at this angle, but somehow my eye tricked me into thinking they were circular. That's your brain. I think that's my brain. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know your eye. <laughs> yes, your brain is saying they have to be round. <laughs> I, I think that's it. I mean, it's just really interesting seeing how I picked it up. Another thing that's really cool is, you know, um, craters are innies, but we have a couple of mountains of outies over here, volcanic domes. And I, I, I like that because they're, you know, they're, they're so wrong. You're so used to seeing craters. And then when these things pop the, out the other way, and that's one of the reasons I like doing this uh, black and white on gray is that you can catch the shading the shading really nicely like that like that you have a wonderful three-dimensional effect to your yes to yeah your I, I i like that, really good. I, that, that that's thank you I, I like to catch that and i like to catch little details like 
you know, I, I saw this crater in the wall of the Cenus Iridium. The, these are called the Jura Mountains, by the way. Um, and that that's what Mike caught with his uh, camera. But it's one of those little details that nobody ever talks about. You just see it. And the more you look, the more you see. That, that's always what I feel. So there we go. Um, so before, uh, so Bill is here. I think I saw him on. Oh yeah, there you are, Bill. Yeah, I'm here. Before we, we, we go talk about uh, Blake, there are a couple of announcements. Um, we should uh, we should mention observing from Violet Scarberry. Oh yeah, you want to talk? Well, they're, they're, they're wonderful. wonderful. I can't switch back and forth because I'm recording the meeting, but there's a gallery online, both of the event and um, I can the read. images that were taken at the Island Star Party. And there's some pretty nice ones. So, or does anybody else have? Can somebody else uh, find the Zen Folio for the? Um, for the Star Party, and I'm going to do some announcements while somebody looks for them. Is that you, David, uh, shaking your head? You can put it up. Okay. Anyway, so before you do, though, um, announcements. One is next Monday, there's a teacher's workshop that Lori wants to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Right now? Sure. Okay. Um, so Mary Beth Lechek, Lechek is um, the a director of communications at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope in Hawaii. And about every two years or so, she is invited to come to Victoria because the HAA is very much a part of the Canada France Hawaii, uh, Hawaii Telescope. And she comes and does um, workshops and presentations and gets to talk in person to uh, the people at the HAA and at the university. And so she's coming this coming week. She's going to be here on the Wednesday. And when she comes, we always try to see if we can get a teacher's workshop um, going. And so we're doing that next Monday afternoon between 4.30 and 7. And we have put out the call to the teachers to come and uh, Mary Beth is absolutely fabulous, one of the very best people that I know that gives demonstrations and talks about how to teach astronomy concepts in the classroom. And she's very animated and does, does a beautiful job of that. And then we're also going to be putting out a lot of different activities and showing our virtual reality and doing eclipse presentation, uh, eclipse activities and doing all kinds of things at, at um, in kind of a... Um, um, away with the teachers as well so that's on the that's on the um the uh the monday night but she's also going to be our speaker on this coming saturday night and so she will be presenting on um on uh, uh what's happening in hawaii and uh and all and gives a and gives really good anybody that wants to come up to the star party and you know and wants to come up as a volunteer uh you'll be welcome to hear either the first one at eight o'clock or the second one at, at, at nine um so uh she also um asked whether or not she could come to an astro cafe <laughs> so um so next monday after our our teacher's workshop then we're going to see if we can get her um, to kind of go flying down the Pat Bay Highway and uh, and come and either meet you there or or we'll do her online. So she'll be coming in as the speaker. Does she want to give us a talk or is she just going to join in? Oh, I think she's got, I think she's, you know, uh, I think she said she was, you know, ready to give a little bit of a presentation on what's going on. So, so if everybody, uh, if you don't get to the 16th, if you don't get to her presentation on the 16th at the star party, then she probably has got a, you know, truncated version of that um, to give to you guys as well. She's wonderful. She's a lovely speaker and, and really is animated and um, is enjoyable to listen to. So come one, come all. Boy, you're working her hard. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. And then, and then in between she does presentations at the, at the NRC, like the NRC, and talks away and has meetings with with them as well so she's just 
she's just on the go from the time she comes to the time she leaves. But it's that's her life, so she loves it. Yeah. Lori, could you repeat her name, please? Mary Beth, uh, two words, uh, Laychak, so L-A-Y-C-H-A-K. I might add that Mary Beth gave a talk at our last uh, general yes. uh, annual me meeting um, uh, before COVID. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're a great speaker. And okay. and Mary Beth is, I mean, is so incredibly generous, as is the uh, uh, Canada France Hawaii Telescope um, group, in that every participant at the teacher's workshop is going to get a sun, a moon, and an earth um, a celestial buddy in order to be able to kind of do the whole thing in their classrooms with um, the eclipse. Um, so uh, like a very, uh, a very generous offer for everybody that is going to be there. So amazing. And she's going to be um, promoting that. That's great. So Lori, can non-teachers go to that? If they work with students, I'm thinking like yes, yes, I yes, I would think. I mean, we would we would like to have the it, the the. Uh, we've only got room for thirty people, but if there's room, absolutely. If anybody is doing outreach, um, and all of you that are doing outreach with students, that would be a it would be a wonderful thing to come up and see. Yes. So I missed for a second because I was putting bread dough in the fridge. Um, when on Monday is that? Monday four thirty to seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me know if there's a hole. Yes, thank you. I would I'd love to have you come. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I'll get you to I'll get you to work, Bill. Yeah. Okay. okay. There we go. The next announcement is uh our next council meeting is actually tomorrow night. A advert went last week to everybody with the Zoom link. I uh, Come see how the sausage is made. There's, uh, you know, a, the, this wonderful club is only here because of the volunteerism and leadership of, of a few. And we always like to have people know how it works and how, how uh, we get to run it. And so everybody is welcome to the council meetings. Um, and the last thing is uh, for Alex has agreed to uh, be the coordinator for the reinvigorated university Wednesday night meetings. Uh, it's not going to happen in September. Um, is there anything to say now or should it just be a stay tuned? I'm going to go be there on, on this coming Wednesday and buy out the room. Very good. I agree with some experiments. Okay. And we just want to record it. Yeah, we just need to record. Yeah. Okay. Well, so finally, after the long COVID hiatus, we uh, are welcome back at the university. We have the coordinator um, and uh, Stay tuned and we will we'll have a program coming up over uh, the next few months. Uh, so, so, so Randy, Randy, I have the Island Star Party images available. If uh, Joe sure, wants let, to let, kind let's of do that. And uh, then um, I guess the only other big thing is also you, David, because uh, oh no, no, yeah, we'll talk about Blake, but I want you to talk about the six and the Algal observations you're planning. Right. I could just follow that up really quickly. Yeah, I'll, I'll go through this. I don't want to take time away from uh, the Blake Memorial thing. So, okay. So let's um, let's do this. Um, as uh, Joe mentioned, there's uh, quite a number of images that come from the Star Party. So I don't know who. That's Brock's. Do you have anything to say about that one, Brock? Uh, yeah, that's... Um was one that I put together. It's uh, NGC 6914. I actually did some of the data earlier, but I finished up the, the last night of my imaging data with the star party. And uh, I thought this was a very interesting image just because of the fact that it's such a beautiful mix 
of both the red hydrogen nebula in the background plus some dark nebula and uh, the reflection nebula, the lighter white, more bluish white colored reflection nebula from those young stars. And uh, yeah, ni a nice mix of elements for sure. It's a really nice mix of elements. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Of course, so the star party oh. was a great chance to finish it up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Nice rig, by the way. I, I'm envious of the tripod. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so um, Joe, I think this is yours. Uh, some shots of the Milky Way. Uh, there's two of those, that one and this one. You can see the dipper there. Did you want to say anything about these two, Joe? Um, I'm having a hard time seeing them. But one, I think the previous one had a little streak in it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, yeah, really it does. Yeah, yeah, it's there. It's there. You see it? Right in there, yeah. Right through the middle I see of it. the uh, Milky Way. Yeah, there you yep, go. Yep, yep. So the, yeah. the Perseid meteor, that basically is what you would see visually. Um, yeah, there's there's one here, too. There is. Something. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. there, oh, too. Right by Polaris. Streets in both. I, I just yep. can't see the Polaris screen, but they're there. And if you... Yep. I'll provide the link so you, you can blow it up a bit and see it better. Yep, and some more here as well. Uh, I guess that's 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 yours as well, is it, uh, Joe? No, I don't know, but it might have been mine. Yeah. I... Oh, maybe. Okay. Here, there's a little kind of Perseid streak there as well. And then yeah, another one there. Good. Okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. I was grabbing images from wherever they were, and I just put them all in. I I did twenty second exposures. I just kept it going for a long time, and uh, several times I caught airplanes going over. But you can tell <laughs> the difference because they didn't change in brightness over the twenty seconds. Mm. Whereas uh, if if they are you know start off bright and they they trail away, then you know it was a uh, it was a meteor. And you know, a good point to make about these two photos is you know, the Milky Way is visible naked eye from the Star Party site, whereas Victoria not gonna happen. Yeah, that's a that's actually a good segue to the next shot. And by the way, um a big thanks to Reg Dunkley who bailed me out of dead batteries. So <laughs> um so here we go. Here's a here's a shot of the Milky Way uh, off on the corner. This is near where uh, Reg's uh, uh, palatial tent was. It's a very large astro tent. And uh, yeah, and big thanks uh, for the batteries. So um, I I used my tracker for this so I could get a little bit more intensity with it. But uh, yeah, that was the Milky Way. Pretty cool. And this is. Dan's. I, I guess Dan's not here. But Dan Dan had some trackers going. Um, what was he beside you, Brock? I can't I can't remember now. At the star party. Uh, okay. So Dan these was are, uh, further. He was a couple of scopes down for me. Yeah, the okay. So that's yeah. This is the Seder area. Lots of emissions. Some... I'm not familiar with the helping hands, but I'm assuming that's what this thing is with the dark nebula. Lots of dust. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Joe will put a, a link so you guys can peruse this. This is not a very good way of looking at these because you kind of really need to look at them closely. And Ron, is, is Ron around? Yeah. This was, uh, I started this at the star party. This was about 30 hours of 900 second exposures that I put together three nights in a row. Um, yeah. And you can, and you can barely see the outline of the, uh, of the bat, eh? The uh, O3 rich, uh, yeah, uh, giant squid. But uh, this is the flying bat nebula. I was really pleased with this. Yeah, it's very nice. I, I remember you talking about it at the star party. The, another important thing, Ron, is you were the winner of the grand prize, that, that telescope with the really good bounce. 
Have you been? I know, and I still, I still that? can't believe it. It's just wonderful. I'm just starting <laughs> to learn to use it. Had to buy a couple of pieces for it, and uh, and uh, it's just an exciting time for me. Excellent. And this is, I'm oh, trying to remember. When kids get the, the big prize. <laughs> <Isn't it great? laughs> yeah. Well, and it's a really good telescope. It was Dan Posey's old telescope that got exchanged for one that Dave Payne had. And Dave added on a uh, a really decent mount. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, we're, we're I... glad it was somebody who, was, who would use it so enthusiastically. Yeah, I have to. I have to say to Dave, uh, it was a very generous uh, thing for the for the prize. But uh, you know what? I have to admit, I felt really guilty because uh, the morning of the draw, there were all these people filling out the tickets for the draw, and I jokingly said to them all, "Don't bother. I'm going to win it." <laughs> and so I'm I'm a little embarrassed. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, so Ron, are you available for kind of future predictions and stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a uh, this is Dave Payne's, and uh, I, I know he's not here, but uh, he he always does such fabulous work. Um, I don't know what he was using. Oh, he was using his uh, Televu, his one one twenty seven. Don't know much about this image. Do, do you know much about this one, Brock? Not really, no. Okay. There's a huge uh, right up above. fire and flying dragons. Well, have a look at this. Have a look at this for sure. It's not something you okay. see. Thanks, David. Okay. Thank you. So well, where would you like, like me to go from on, here? David. Carry on? Okay. Uh, okay. Minima of Algol. So this is something I started um, last year with the beginners group. Um, I was trying to get them interested in variable stars. Uh, last, If you don't know, the last couple of years, I've just kind of started uh, researching variable stars and uh, learning how the stars in the, in the universe are anything but static. Uh, so a good beginner variable star to look at is, is Elgol. And um, I actually just recently, with the beginners group, uh, I think it was last week, we went through the... Um, the uh, the effort of actually going through how to go about finding it. But just before I say that, uh, Elgo is a variable star. Now it's a very special kind of variable star. It's called an eclipsing binary. So that means that there's actually two, um, uh, two stars. And uh, when one goes over the other, there's a big dip. And then like when the little one is going over the big one, you get a secondary eclipse, which is small. But when the big one goes over the, the the small one, you get these big dips. So the beauty of Algol is that this cycle is quite short. Now, a lot of cycles are like 180 days. Some of them are over a year. But gratefully, uh, Algol is less than three days. So you can almost see this in one night. Uh, but as Jill says, she would be sleeping. So... Uh, I, I don't say that you have to do it in one night. I would suggest two. So here's where to find it. Now, I, I think uh, many of the beginners group knows how to find this now. Uh, if you go and look for Cassiopeia, which is the W, and you look down uh, down the, uh, the line from Cassiopeia, you'll see this star called Mirfat. So if you see this in binoculars, there's a huge... Uh, association of stars in this area. Uh, so Mirfak is not hard to find, and Elgol is down here. So the whole premise behind this is uh, differential uh, comparison. So basically, we have reference stars to look at. There, there's Elmac, there's Kappa Percy, there's Epsilon Percy, and as Jill quite rightly no noted, uh, there's a Rho Percy, which is down here which is a good comparison star as well. So Elgol goes from a minimum of mag magnitude 3.4 uh, and back to a normal of about 2.1. So you can see LMAC at 2.1 is a good comparison. When, when Elgol is, quote, normal and it's not dimmed, these two are about the same brightness. So that's the whole idea. You have comparison stars. Uh, we're going to be looking 
at Elgol uh, at a precise time. Uh, for instance, here are the dates that we can try this. So it can be as early as September 16th at 12, 12, 10, 12. I don't know how many of you will go out. This is a Saturday night, I think. Um, I'll probably go out to Cattle Point and, um, uh, and be there for anybody who wants to try it. Uh, there are other times as well, October. These two dates in October are good times as well. So this is a good uh, reference. If you want to try future dates and you don't want to try them at these times, you can go to this website. And Joe, if you maybe uh, lift this off of the uh, of this uh, recording, maybe put that in the notes as well. So I don't know if there's any questions, but uh, that's that's basically the minima of Algol. And uh, let What's me know if anybody's telescope. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You could do it with binoculars, actually. I, I mean, a small refractor is sufficient. Uh, Daub is okay. Any of those are okay. David, so could, it, you, mm -hmm. could you do it uh, from the parking lot of the center of the universe on Saturday night? You could. You could. You could. Yeah, because you're. I thought you were coming to the star party on the sixteenth, David. <laughs> with with oh, Mary yeah, Beth with yeah. Mary Beth Lechek. yeah. So okay, cool. okay. Then I have a yeah. I have a whole audience of people that a are going to try. Whole audience, this. we can try that. Yeah. Oh, audience. You thank you, thank you for reminding me. Oh, boy, <laughs> boy, you caught that really quickly. How long is it from maximum to minimum, and then back up? Okay, so this is it. The times that I gave you are mid eclipse. So a couple of hours before, which is too bright actually, but if you were to hang out after 10 and stay on the property, you could catch it starting to come back to normal within two hours. But I, as I said to Jill, Jill said, I'm not staying up. So I said, okay, next day you look again and it should come back to normal. So it, it, it's such a short cycle, you can do that. Okay, now the, the next thing is, maybe uh, Lori can help me with this. Uh, we are planning on doing something interesting on the 14th of October. Let's see if I can find this here. There we go. So, partial solar eclipse. Now, we don't get an annular, but we get a partial on October 14th. And... Um, Lori, you want to talk about what we think we might do? Right. Why don't you go through what you've got there first? Oh, okay. And then I will. Yep. All right. So uh, I plotted this in Starry Night. So I could see that uh, by the time the sun goes over the horizon line, it's right at the beginning of the eclipse. It's just starting to eclipse. Um, we get to maximum eclipse at 912. And we're basically out of there by 1038. So and it's quite a, a short Saturday thing. Morning. There's no excuse. Saturday no. morning. Saturday no morning. No excuse. No excuse. Saturday morning. Now, th this is a suggestion. Uh, we're not saying you have to be at the center of the universe. In fact, it's kind of the limited seating, isn't it, uh, Lori? Well, again, 200. Yeah. 200, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyways, this is it. Uh, maybe, Joe, I could get you maybe to put this on the website as well. For people so they can see that the times are actually for time and date for the beginning the maximum and the end and then all the other times i plotted uh from starry night so if you want to do a sequence or something like that you could figure out uh when to do them okay so yeah. uh, if there's any questions uh certainly um uh send me a note okay can i can i share my screen yes Okay, let's see if I can do this. Uh, oh, can I share my screen now? There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm going to just start here. Um, so I just threw this together just to give you information. This is not anything that's, you know, that I, I certainly, if I was going to do something with the eclipse, I would be doing something with lovely things coming out of it, but I just didn't get that far. Um, so Saturday, October the 14th, um, we are going to uh, host a, a, like a party up at, the, up at the center of the universe, and we called it 
an eclipse breakfast bite because we thought, well, the moon is going to be biting out of the sun and we're going to be biting out of a little bit of some breakfast at the same time. Um, uh, we're where it's going to be up at the center hosted by the friends and we're hoping that people from the RESC will also um, will also help uh, to to do this. Um, what we're going to be doing is starting at, at eight at eight o'clock and we'll have our total our solar telescopes up for the viewing. We have solar projection devices to show, um, and we also will be doing a live streaming uh, from Exploratorium. There's actually two of them, Exploratorium from San Francisco and timeanddate.com uh, will also be doing a live viewing. And so we can, and this is the live viewing of the annular eclipse. So not, it's not a total, the total isn't until April, but we, but we have the annular eclipse and it starts in, um, uh, in Oregon and goes, uh, goes, uh, east and south and then back down through Texas um but we get we get like 79 percent of the of the total eclipse up up here in uh, up here in uh, Victoria sorry um may I'm just kind of I'm throwing these things out if you wanted to uh, bring your camera or cell phone we might be able to kind of show how that can go on the back of one of our telescope our solar telescopes and maybe some people might be able to get a picture or two We've got uh, glasses coming from the RASC. We have actually ordered 1,250 of them, um, and we should be getting them uh, within uh, two weeks of the star party. So we're hoping that everybody will have will be able to get uh, get uh, solar glasses. And of course, when we're giving them when we're giving them out, a whole big thing is the whole um, the whole safety aspect. Of it, I mean, we're not going to give anybody any glasses until we kind of talk about the safety, the safety part. Uh, we'll be having a little bit of some breakfast, uh, breakfast nibbles up at the up at the center, and um, and hopefully people will be able to kind of have um, have some things uh, there for people to um, to eat and drink just while they're doing things. We wanted to have a couple of short presentations. I just kind of kind of eclipse on a one is what is an annular eclipse? Why do we have a partial and we don't get the annular? Um, what you need to know to, to do everything really safely. I was actually even thinking if it was really nice out, we could actually even put some of the chairs out on the deck and have like a little presentation just right out on the deck while the, you know, while it's, while the, the, while it's kind of going into uh, the maximum partial. I, I, we, we've got to figure this one out. We've got eclipse. We've got kids eclipse crafts. We're also thinking of an adult creative table um, to put on so people can 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 uh, can do something there. We'll have eclipse demonstrations and how we can show those. We'll have our planetarium open. Our gift shop will be open. Whoops, sorry. And then and so what we're going to be doing is it's going to be five dollars a person. And that will be for all the activities to get a bit of breakfast and, and have eclipse classes. And we're also going to put in here um, things on donations Like we'll have different things. Like if you, if you, um, you know, donate $20, then we'll give you something like that kind of thing. We, I just put that in there so that I would remember. Attendees are limited to 200 because that's what we have been given by the NRC on the Hill. It'll be through Eventbrite um, to, get, to get the tickets. I've just put both of our websites up there. And this is just what we're looking for now. Now we we'd love to have people come up and be and and you know bring their solar telescopes up and be part of this. And the, what we're going to do is it's going to be rain or shine, rain or shine or cloud. Like we will have pre like presentations on eclipses and we'll have the live feed and we'll do all the activities even if we can't see the solar eclipse itself. Um, so it's a little bit different than, for instance, if other people decide to go up onto Mount Ptolemy or to, to go to Cattle Point and take some of the eclipse glasses and kind of, you know, show people what's going on. If it's really, really cloudy, you probably won't be doing that, but we'll still be kind of doing something up on the hill no matter, no matter what. So if you, if you have got a little bit of time, we'll be finished by 1030 in the morning and uh and we'll throw everybody off the hill at that time and then um and then we'll wait until um we see the live stream from the from from on april the 8th but it'll only be in the east i'm sorry we 
You have to you have to move to go and see that one. So anyway, if there's any questions, this is just it's just like I just I threw this together just really quickly, just so that we can get uh, something going. Bring this to the council meeting and we can have a little talk about the council meeting, too. But we'd love to see everybody um, uh, help out. Um, and if you do help out, then you don't need to pay for the ticket. <laughs> so because we'll take volunteers. All right. Thanks. I'm I'm now finished for the night. I I I'm, I will not talk anymore. I'm done, Randy. No, no, Lori. Did my order for glasses get in? Did they take it? Um, I we're getting a thousand. How many did you ask for? Just fifty. I'll be in Whistler oh, that oh, weekend. No, you'll be you'll be fine. Like no, that's that'll be part. That'll be part of that thousand. It'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Because I want to show my mushroom group. Yeah. No, we no, we had I knew I knew that you were doing that. I mean, we have a thousand. We have a, a thousand of them coming for the RASC. So, you know, there'll be lots of there'll be lots. Cool. Okay. So I'll stop my share. That's great. There we go. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Um that was great. So now I want to talk about a uh a person I I'm sad to say I uh, only have seen online and uh, he, he's been a very influential member of the Canadian amateur astronomy community. And uh, it was with quite some shock that we got the letter from uh, Bill Weir, uh, I guess not even two weeks ago that Blake Nakaro died uh, far too young. He's been, um, among other things, he was chair of the Observers Committee of the National uh, RASC. Um, it's fun when you're watching the Toronto RASC um, meetings, whenever they uh, say, what's happening in the sky this month? And they always say, and for Blake, here are a couple of good binary stars to look at. Um, anyway, what I would like in the remaining time is to, uh, if anybody has any memories of Blake, that would be great. And then I also would like to talk about uh, observing doubles, because he, he talked about it very passionately. And I think as a group here, uh, we could do a good tribute to him by talking about the joys and interest in, in looking for double stars. But Bill, do you have anything you'd like to start off with? Well, it's It seems kind of weird because I got to know Blake, I guess, when he started being a member of the observing committee and then he eventually took over it when the previous chair resigned. He had other things he was doing. It was Dave Chapman who ended up doing the Mi'kmaq moons and he's been busy with other things. But um, and he, yeah, he was the one that created the newest um, observing certificate of the double star thing, which really he brought up probably about 10 years ago with probably two or three previous chairs ago that he wanted to um, create this double star program that was different than the one that the Astronomical League has. And so it took him years of vetting out different things. And he ran through very many iterations with us to make it all work. And eventually it came out and almost immediately it, it's caught on. There's, I think already 10 or 12 people already that have the double star certificate. Yeah, he was just a real big, he did that, but you know, he, and all his other accomplishments. He was one of the people that ran the David Dunlop telescope and he was on many committees and all sorts of things. But I don't know, I just, I always just think he was like a really nice guy. When he took over the chair, he just wanted to actually phone people and that were on the committee to talk to them, to find out who they were and who he was kind of hanging out with. And that was really interesting. But my first, my, it was kind of funny because the first time I really interacted with him, other than just emails going around, were was at the General Assembly. It was one of the COVID ones. It was, I guess, the second one, where 
they had introduced Gather Town. And my only computer is an iPad. And so the mobile version of that Gather Town section didn't really cooperate well with mobile devices. And so you couldn't get your camera to work. So that when you were in the session, like in the, the Tiki bar and all that, you were just your avatar. And the avatars were really, really, so I'd show up and I got ignored a lot because you'd walk up to a crowd and usually in that, then your camera starts working and you get a little screen and people can see you and they know who they're talking to. I was always just this little person that was hanging around beside and it was like people didn't really know I was there. And the avatars were really limited because they didn't really have middle-aged, bald, gray-haired white guys with beards. And so I found this one that sort of suited that, that I was, it, it sort of had gray on top and smooth and a gray under cover to the head. And so I was wandering around as this person and quite happy and every once in a while people would notice me. And then it was really late at night and there was this one group left and it was like Jenna Hines and a few other, they were all the Toronto people. They were all just sort of hanging out. So I walked up to them and they immediately said hi. So it was kind of neat because they weren't, my screen wasn't working. And then one of them who was Blake pointed out that my name didn't quite match my appearance. And I said, well, it's just all I could find. And he said, well, do you realize you're a young woman wearing a hijab, a gray hijab? <laughs> and, and it was, it's like, oh, is that what that is? Because I couldn't really see it well. And, and it was like, well, I'm cool with that. And we <laughs> hung up. <laughs> so I, and actually this year I went looking for the same outfit and I couldn't find it. It wouldn't let a guy do that, which I also had issues with because why not? Maybe that's how I want to identify. And, um, but it was just, that was the first time I met him. And then I was explaining how I couldn't get my camera to work. And now Blake was a real technical guy. I mean, everything that's on the observing page on the national thing, he redid. Like he'd say, I want to do this. And then within like a day, it had changed. He was just, and he was the trainer for the Stellarium and all that. And so he spent probably a half an hour trying to figure out how I could get my camera to work. And we'd wander off together and then we'd re come into the crowd and he'd say, try doing this and that. And then we realized that it was just that it was a beta version and it couldn't change it at all. So to me, that was like what Blake was. He was like really wanting to be friendly and do stuff for people. And that's, that's what I always saw with him. And um, Randy said that he listened to the recent, there's a podcast a couple of RAC members in Regina have called the Actual Astronomy Podcast. And they'd had Blake on a couple of times talking about his double stars. And actually one of the ones that he did, the last one was really just weeks before he died. And they didn't even know. He made some references when they were first talking, but it really wasn't like he could tell, he would tell anybody. And that's just sort of the way he was. Like if you look on the observing webpage and even the double star thing, which he created, it was him. And he gives no reference the, to the fact that this was a program that he created. All the other ones they mentioned who started them and all that, he left that out. And that's why it seems kind of weird, just kind of like memorializing them and all that, because I think that that would kind of piss him off to a little bit of a degree because he seemed to be more of that modest type. What did Peter just say? Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Um, I'm that, sure Peter might know him a bit. To bring up, but he was kind of the astronomer in residence in Killarney Park. Can you talk about that, Peter? Yeah, sure. Um, good evening, everyone. I. I didn't know Blake very well. As you've already pointed out, he was very active in Toronto Center. And um, he moved about a year, not more than two years ago, he moved back to St. Thomas. And what he told us was St. Thomas is a smaller city in Ontario, close to London. And he uh, attached to the London Center. 
And he told us that he was moving back to this area because he had spent his teenage years in St. Thomas, went to high school in St. Thomas. And uh, he retired and he wanted to uh, spend, you know, time in his old stomping grounds, basically. He didn't tell us that he was sick. And I, whether, I don't know much more than that about it. Uh, obviously, he passed away due to this illness. Uh, and we kind of take it for granted that moving back to St. Thomas had something to do with um, with his illness. He, he had family there, but I'm not sure. I think I heard it was his sister that was still living in St. Thomas. Um, but anyway, the I don't know anything about the Killarney thing. Killarney's about a eight eight hour drive north of London, and Blake was working there a few years ago already, not recently. But it's a pretty cool job to uh, have initiated the that. York University Observatory. Yeah, and, uh, they hire somebody. He said it's a dream job because you've got beautiful dark skies. You've got all these interested people coming by. In his last podcast, he, he said the only problem was uh, that, uh, or whether it might have been the podcast he did it with them a few years ago, said the only problem is that he timed it so the beginning was during the full moon. So, but that, that's going to come to when we, we start talking about double stars. Uh, but he just loved it up there. Yep. So th that's that's all I can really tell you from personal experience that he had attached to London Center lately, and we didn't know him very well. We haven't been meeting in person the last few years, and so I had never even met him face to face. Just talked to him online a few times, and uh, he helped me out a couple times too. So it's it's totally sad, of course, and we've actually lost like three or four members of our center just in the past year or two, which is really kind of scary when you think about it but anyway i i won't take up more of your time but i did put the link to his obituary his local obituary here uh okay. in the chat as well now does anybody else have any personal memories of uh blake yeah randy i, I just i just want to say a few words about blake i i don't know blake very well but i I did take his Stellarium courses, and I'm pretty sure there are people in this crowd that took the the courses as well. But he was such an immaculate trainer. Um, I really loved his shortcuts. Like I, um, I'm a bit of a closet trainer myself, so I, I kind of really appreciate the work that goes into um, uh, making it easy for somebody to use a tool. But I I really regret like uh, he did offer to uh, give a presentation for double stars for the beginners group, and I I wasn't really quick to do that. I I tried to do it, and then other things came up, but I really regret it now because we 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 could have had him do that. And I agree with you, Randy. I think there are many of us here who would be glad to uh, sort of pay tribute to to Blake by engaging in double stars and i i for one will definitely do that so it's funny oh jill yeah i took uh, three courses uh stellarium courses with blake and he was fantastic and i i thought about him today because i i he taught us um how to download um you know new objects and uh laurie was mentioning there's a new comment nisha mirror so I was able to, just before I came on this call, to um, download it so that I could find it on Stellarium and, and find that it's hopeless. But still, it's, it's, um, it's cool. He, we, we were given good um, notes, sheets to help us figure things out. And, uh, and he was a fantastic presenter and a really patient person. And you could go to him um, outside of the classroom and, and uh, he'd help you work through things. So it's a real loss. Thank you did that, Jill. Good to know. So he um what he, he describes it as uh a a really underappreciated aspect of our hobby. And uh the way he would word it is it's something fascinating to do if the moon is out and you can't see anything. And I I'm the opposite way when the moon 
is an ad, I wonder what's the point? Why should I bring my telescope out? Um, but the thing is, double stars, uh, really, you can do a great deal even in city lights. You know, if you don't have a dark sky and uh, you don't you don't have uh, all the um, perfect uh, equipment and seeing and everything that you might want to look at your fuzzballs, uh, the, the variety of double stars is something that, that just kept pulling his attention. Um, one of the things is it is uh, a great scientific merit. The, the study of double stars, as in David showed off the uh, uh, algal, um, provided a great deal of information about astrophysics that, that we uh, understand because Newton's laws allow us to work out the masses of objects from, from uh, seeing orbits. And uh, so a huge amount of information has come uh, through the study of double stars, but, um, and, and specifically binary stars, stars that are together. He uses the term double for meaning any multiple that could be a triplet or a quadruple um, of stars that are in close proximity. He says that he doesn't discriminate on uh, the actual mechanism. So if it's just a coincidental double, that's also fine by him. But he likes to see, uh, uh, especially you can see colors. You can see the differential colors between two stars uh, really well when they're next to each other. And uh, he, he liked the challenge of splitting stars. And he would look at the same uh, binary or, or double uh, at different magnifications. And he took very good notes. And one of the things that I really liked in the tribute podcast that Chris and Shane did on Actual Astronomer, and this was just last week's uh, podcast of the Actual Astronomer, is they read out his observation notes in, um, he, he made a list of his favorite binary stars for each season. And he would, would say about how beautiful they were and why he found them beautiful, because they might be a double-double or something. And one of them, he just described it, you know, there were these stars, this magnitude, they had this angular separation. And then, wow. That was all his comment was. And apparently it wasn't typical of him to say, wow. So it, it must have been really a nice one. I, is there anybody here who looks for doubles? I know that, um, what was his name? Uh, was it uh, Miles that uh, did the, um, the double uh, list from the American um, Association? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, Jill Jill has done the double one. I think from the Astro uh, Astro League is that the one you did, Jill? Yeah, from the American one. In, I did yeah. the monocular double one though. Um, Blake's list is way beyond me. You, you yeah. needed a telescope for for Blake's stuff. So I yeah, but but he designed it for small telescopes. Yeah. So he he wanted that one to be for urban sky people. That was his whole point. He didn't want it to require people going somewhere or needing large aperture. You, he wanted it to be something that you could do from an urban place with a small telescope. That was the point of that list, was to make sure that it was accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. So he actually, really you know, kind of, yeah, actually, he almost I, thought of it. I, Go ahead. I noticed with the beginners group, there was a, a very strong interest in doubles. The times that I've been out with you guys, uh, people are looking at doubles. So I think again, or they just haven't done it yet. So Jill, do you like looking at doubles? And if so, why? I like finding them. Right. The challenge of finding them. 
lot of them are just two little dots in the sky, but they're, it's interesting because you have to know how far apart they are and what the position angle is, you know, where they are in relation to each other. And there's, every time you look up, they all look like doubles. So it's a real challenge to find the correct double. <laughs> and are you good at it now? No, no, I had no. a real, I had a terrible <laughs> time on that, but I did complete the, uh, the, the, the binocular course, but I, it, it's hard. It's a tough list because I know Nelson Walker was working Nelson. on that when oh, yeah. we'd be out together and, and he'd be like struggling and yelling at his binoculars and he took a <laughs> telescope with him. So sometimes he could try and confirm that. Like it was, a, it was like a four inch refractor, but it was like to try and confirm, okay, that is it. Now, why can't I split it? It was that kind of thing because some of them were so tight. Now, when I first started doing astronomy and I was using, which I still use a lot, the Cambridge Star Atlas, because I live in a limited sky location, I would observe everything on the page that was listed. And so I would run into that there's the variables I didn't deal with. Sorry, David. <laughs> but the doubles, they were all there. And I thought, well, if they're in this sort of minor atlas, I must be able to do it with a six inch telescope. And so it is that cool thing of trying, when, especially when they're really multiples. So it's often trying to split the third one or the fourth one. Like I looked at one the other night, the it's Iota Cassiopeia. So in Cassiopeia, in the wide open part of the V, there's a third star. And if you look at that one, it's a very cool double. It's a triple star. That's like two that are really well spaced, but then you have to try and magnify till you can split the one that goes off like a little hockey stick. And yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there certainly are challenges as well. Now, Mar Margie just asked me if I could show a double star just so that people know what we're talking about. So I, I brought this up. Uh, this is actually a favorite one of mine for outreach because it's already always easy to show people stuff associated with the Dipper. So this is Elcor and Mizar. This is kind of like, um, uh, if you've got really good eyesight, you'll see these two. But it's an easy one. It's an easy one. Absolutely, it's an easy Naked one. Naked eye. Naked eye. So when you start to increase magnification, this is what they call splitting doubles. So as you increase the magnification, Mizar here splits apart. And in fact, I even do it gradually for people because I ask them, you know, does it look kind of strange? And the, my expectation is they'll tell me it kind of looks like a football, like it starts to look stretched out. And then as you increase the magnification, they split apart. So that's that's the concept of splitting a double. Margie. Yes, I thought I would just show you the Explore the Universe program has um, uh, a lot of double stars. So for each season, there are double stars on it. So I'll just show you. This is one that uh, we were uh, we were um, looking at. I looked at in May, and this is. Um, uh, uh, in the constellation Lyra, uh, a lot of people know where that Vega is the is just above the constellation Lyra, uh, and it's a very bright star. And so Lyra has uh, three doubles in it. It has epsilon one and two, zeta one and two, and delta one and two. So that gives you an idea of. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. And so that's where they were. And all of that was done with binoculars because everything on the on the Explore the Universe um, can be done with binoculars. So you don't need a telescope. That's great. How close are you, Margie? I'm I'm one season away. Nice. Absolutely right. The double double. 
So hey, four stars. Hey, that's the Tim Horton yeah. one. That always goes over magnificently with people. <laughs> but you do know that the whole constellation is a Tim Hortons constellation because it has the uh, ring yeah. nebula, which is a donut. That's right. <laughs> and for those people who are new, when you're when you're looking at uh, what we just saw um, with uh, um, Epsilon uh, Lyra, it's it, there's a program called Stellarium, and you can look at Stellarium and um, uh, when you first look at a star, for example, um, it, it it appears as one, and then as you zoom in on it, you can see that there are two. So it's the zooming in factor that 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 separates these two stars. Just like when you increase magnification at your scope. Well, I think Jim is saying the right thing. We had a really full agenda tonight. I thank all the contributors. Uh, that was a wonderful way to start our season, and I look forward to seeing you. Uh, we do not meet on stat holidays, uh, so that means actually the first two uh, Mondays of October are both stat holidays. Are, but we, we won't be holding uh, Astro Cafe. Uh, but um, other than that, uh, we look forward. We are always interested in people who will host. Uh, we often have a speaker. We also need somebody who will do the technical side of setting up the computer here. Uh, it's not onerous. And uh, it is always appreciated. And next week, Ken is tech chair, and Jim and Jim Cliff is, is, the host. is the host remotely. Very good, everybody. And we will have Mary Beth Lechuk speaking. See you next week. Nice to see all the new people. Yeah, welcome everybody. Oh, and some of the older people too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Come, <laughs> let's get cookies. <laughs>